Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Corona Adult Sabbath School class that will be presenting the Sabbath School lesson for uh, January the 30th. We welcome you. We have several um, folks with us for teaching this, e uh, this evening. Of course, we're recording in the evening, and then you are able to watch it whenever it's um, loaded up um, starting Friday evening and again on Sabbath morning. I'm Stan Clark and joining me tonight for teaching is Mary Jo Macias, Charles Roldan, and um, Pastor Gary Tabor. So welcome everyone. We're going to have a good time working through some of the chapters from the book of Isaiah. And before we start, we'd like to ask Charles to have our prayer for our, our class. Yes, let's bow our head and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, just thanking you for all the blessings you have given us today and also through the week, Lord. Lord, uh, all the things we're going through, Lord, be with us and guide us. Lord, let the Holy Spirit be with us in this lesson. Let us not, um, let us not be the ones to speak, but speak through us, Lord. Um, and challenge us, Lord, to uh, understand your word more clearly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. We'd like to uh, remind you that we're starting, uh, we're kind of uh, moving into the middle of Isaiah this, um, for these, uh, this lesson today. And we're going to be focused on chapter 9 of Isaiah. So before we actually get into the lesson portion, I'd like to remind you, and I'm doing this not so much out of um, a desire to do more teaching, but simply because when I sit down personally to read and study in the Old Testament, there are some things that I do for myself because Maybe it's because I'm old and I have a hard time remembering, but here are some things that help me as I read a, any particular portion of the Old Testament. Uh, the first item is that when I read, I try to figure out what the date is, the year is, of the writer and the era that he's recording. I keep a chart handy when I'm reading the Old Testament, and when I figure out what uh, the period is, I actually pull my chart out and take a look at it, and on the chart is a list of all the kings of and the prophets of Old Testament Israel, and it starts along about the period of um, it's right at, it starts right after Solomon, when Rehoboam, his son, became king in Israel. And of course, that's the same time they set up the counter kingdom um, in northern, the, for the northern kingdom. So one of the very special dates that I kind of, uh, a lot of things revolve around in the Old Testament is the year 722. Does anybody know when, what that date is? And sure, I'm going to tell you, but it's when um, the Northern Kingdom went into what is called captivity. Um, what actually happened was that the Assyrians, when they came in and conquered the Northern tribes, and this wasn't the uh, 722, wasn't the first incursion of the, of the Assyrians but it was the last in that area. And what the Assyrians did was to pick up uh, most everybody there and they moved them in groups, various groups to various parts of the world. And there they lived. And so um, 
when you talk about the 10 northern tribes, is it before the Assyrians? <laughs> yes, it has to be. Because after the Assyrians in 722, the 10 tr northern tribes did not really exist anymore. They were gone. So then the next thing that I remind myself and when I sit down to read and study is to whom the prophet or the counselor is addressing his remarks. Is he here talking to the king of Israel? Is he talking to the people? You have to you know, ask yourself um, that question. Then I'd like to remind you that um, we, we tend to kind of have a, um, a narrow view of the prophetic work because there were so many false prophets in Israel. We don't think about that very often, but the true prophet of God were contesting or competing with all the false prophets that most of these bad kings, especially in the northern tribes, um, had working for them. And a lot of times, you know, the people did not really know who to believe. And so you have to determine, all right, now who is the prophet of God, not just a prophet or claim to be a prophet. And you had to figure out who to believe. The next thing that I think about is the application for the message. Is this a prophecy? Is it, um, what era is it for? Is it a, um, a, a prophecy that's going to come play, um, take place very soon, right in the near future? Or is it a prophecy that is way down the line? And many times the prophecy. Uh, may have several applications, especially does it have an application um, regarding um, the, the Messiah, the messianic prophecies. And sometimes there's another actual application, and we're going to see that in today's lesson, that there's a portion of the prophecy that you can't uh, you can hardly distinguish whether it's a um, first uh, Messiah coming or is it the second Messiah coming. And so sometimes those get intermingled and you have to kind of sit down and sort, the, um, sort those passages um, out so that you can tell which application it is. Is it the new earth, you know, when the Messiah's work is accomplished pretty much? Or is it um, um, a, a first century application when Jesus came the first time? Now, sometimes in reminding ourselves about how to read and study the Old Testament, you almost have to go into the New Testament and let, if there's some passages that pick up these um, messages from the Old Testament, how does the New Testament apply them? Are they quoting from them? Are they applying them to Jesus? Well, okay, if they do, then I'm good with that. I'm safe because it's a great application. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit and they believe that God's uh, message has come down through the prophets to um, talk about Jesus and his life and ministry. And then, of course, his second coming as well. So sometimes you have to read it backwards. You know, go into the Old Testament and pick up the passages that are quoted in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to look at uh, one or two of those uh, this uh, today. So that's my, uh, my reminders for you. So now we're going to go into the first chapter of our lesson for today. And um, I'm doing the Sunday lesson. And um, the le lesson is called Noble Prince of Peace. And um, the lesson that uh, for Sunday 
is called End of Gloom for Galilee. And the reason that they're using that uh, term is because when you finish the book or the chapter eight of Isaiah, and we're mainly focused on chapter nine, I just like to remind you that um, Adventists have focused on chapter eight and verses 20 and 21 um, in our Bible studies an awful lot. But the main message and um, one of the reasons that um, this passage is here is because there was so much darkness. There's so much um, false information. And some of it was brought on by people who were practicing um, speaking to the dead or trying to. And this darkness settled in a big area of the Palestine um, country and especially in a particular zone so this darkness it says in verse 22 of chapter 8 they will look to the earth but behold distress and darkness the gloom of anguish and they will be thrust into thick darkness so then as you move into verse 1 of chapter 9 that same theme continues but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now, there's a couple of interesting terms that I'd like to just... Um, um, review with you. First, first of all, um, these two uh, portions of country, Zebulon and Naphtali. Now, um, sometimes geography actually helps you understand what's going on. So I'd like to just draw you a very um, map, and I guess you really can't see it, so maybe I won't uh, draw that, but in the southern part of Palestine is where the Dead Sea is on the eastern section of it. And then right across the top of the Sea of Galilee is where about um, six or seven miles in is about where the city of Jerusalem is. Now, if you draw a straight line north out of the Dead Sea, you're going to be following the Jordan River, and you're going to go up there about 40 miles, maybe it's 50, and you come to the Sea of Galilee. Now, um, the Sea of Galilee um, has on its western edge the land of Naphtali. Well, what used to be the Naphtali. And then right below Naphtali, is this little area called Zebulon. And it's probably a fraction, maybe a quarter of the size of Zebulon. But um, these two tribes that settled in that area before, um, you know, during the settling of Palestine, that's the, that was their territory. And so now Isaiah is saying, um, that these two pieces of land, these two little um, tribal lands are going to receive something. It says in verse two, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Now, why are these two areas picked on like this? Was there something special about them? And when I um, looked up what was going on, um, it's really um, in the land of Zebulon where the witch of Endor lived that Saul went and um, inquired about the witch of Endor. That area is in Zebulon. So uh, apparently, 
there is a reputation in this territory of um, people who inquire of the dead. Now, um, that in the writing of scripture makes the land and that area especially dark. And then what you want to do when it says that the, um, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, guess where Jesus starts his ministry? It's in Galilee. And it's right in the area, Capernaum was on the western shore of Galilee, right in the area of Nebulon, um, Naphtali and Zebulon. So it's kind of interesting to me that the, <laughs> the light of the world, according to John, um, heads directly into the darkest territory. Isn't that amazing? And um, it's not that they um, that he got cast out or anything. They didn't. He didn't get attacked. When they saw what he did, when they saw the healing that he did, they um, and they and he preached the kingdom of God coming and being present. They believed. They accepted him. They loved the miracles. They loved what God was doing in their area. And this same theme is also stated by uh, Simeon when Joseph and Mary brought um, Jesus to the temple in the very beginning of his life. Simeon comes forth and takes the child and says, a light to the Gentiles. And you have to believe He's quoting, Simeon is quoting this book of Isaiah. Something special was going to happen in this land that had been so dark. Now, one of the things I want to remind you about is that um, this year 722 that I told you about, um, the Assyrians came and carried off all the northern tribes. So the, these people that Jesus came to preach to, they were not, um, probably not Israelites. They were people that had been transplanted from other parts of the world into that territory of um, Naphtali and Zebulon. They were, um, <laughs> One of the, uh, the Bibles that I was reading uh, calls it the land of Gentiles. But um, the word in the Greek is actually the word for nations. Well, either one works because they're non-believers. They were not even, um, they weren't the tribes of uh, the 10 tribes of Israel. They were the people that had been transplanted for, by the Assyrians back in 722 BC. Now, they didn't get transplanted right, transplanted right then because the Assyrians actually moved all the Israelites out, put them elsewhere in the world. And then over a couple of years time period, they brought in subtle settlements and um, over all that territory so that the population would grow and settle there. And you wonder why when the um, people from um, Babylon came back, now the, the Babylonians were uh, the, the um, people in captivity in Babylon, they were Judites, they were Benjamites because Nebuchadnezzar took away the uh, people from Judah, the Southern tribes, and took them to Babylon. And so the returning people from Babylon, they were Israelites. They were the, the people from Judah and Benjamin. And they were sent back by God, decreed under the um, rulers of Babylon to come back and they were given help and to restore the city of Jerusalem. 
but all these people that were attacking them and trying to um, de de um, discourage them and didn't want them to build, guess where they were from? They were from the territory just north, Manasseh and Ephraim and Zebulon and Naphtali, the people that Isaiah calls, says were in darkness, deep darkness. And wonder why they had the, uh, the Judites had trouble with the people in Samaria territory that was in uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, that area is all uh, Samaritan country. It's because those people were from other parts of the world. They didn't know what the Jews were about. They didn't have the prophecies. So this um, passage in chapter nine that talks about a great light, this is messianic. This is telling how Jesus is going to go into that darkest territory and begin his ministry and teach these people, the ones who were in that deep darkness about the kingdom of God. So now we're ready to go on into the next section of our lesson, Mary Jo. And um, you can pick up the next portion of chapter nine in Isaiah uh, for us. Yes, so this lesson is a child for us and we're talking about Isaiah nine, six and seven. So we already know that chapter um, nine, six is our memory verse, but it expounds upon it a little bit. So let's start with that. Um, I'm reading from the New King James Version. So it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice and judgment from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord our hosts will perform this. So here it is, another messianic prophecy, and it's talking about a child. So our lesson talks about that a little bit, saying, okay, well, some have thought perhaps this is um, not so much a messianic prophecy, but um, talking about King Hezekiah. Perhaps it was him. It's just attributes assigned to him because back in the day, they, the, the culture would assign kings and princes and important people these uh, huge names of all their good works and what they're supposed to be and exultant and all that. So it could be possible. However, we know King Hezekiah was already born. So it doesn't make sense that a child unto you is born. Um, so in talking about that and seeing that, you know, we're, we're thinking, okay, so why would this prophecy come about? What are, what, what's, why is he have, why does he have so many different names? Um, and one of the commentaries that I found interesting had suggested that this is an illustrious prophecy of the incarnation of Christ with an enumeration of those characters in which he stands most nearly related to mankind as their savior and of others by which his infinite majesty and Godhead are shown. So, so this um, um, name given for this child, these names are what he'll do for us, what he has done for us, and what we can expect to be done in the future. And um, we have scriptures, of course, supporting that. Um, you have Isaiah 40, 40 verse 5. Um, you have um, Judges 13, 18, when it talks about wonderful, because that's where the divine angel of the Lord spoke with Samson's parents and used the word wonderful as his name. And then the, when they date the offering and he ascended, you know, that was what was said. Um, and you have, he's referred to a um, counselor, knowing what we need and everything that needs to be done for us. Um, He's referred to as divine and an um, eternal creator, everlasting father, which was kind of interesting too when um, 
in, in doing this study because, you know, here's, we see Christ as human man being on earth for us, but now we're seeing that, you know, he was before in the creation. So he is like a father and then he can be a brother and he can be a son. And it's just, he's all in one making that everything is so much more, um, he's everything. Um, um, he also is from the King of David and, um, and his kingdom will be peace eternal. So we're in this kind of alluding to what Stan was saying. This is 700 years before Jesus is born. So it's like forecasting the first, but it's also kind of alluding to the second coming where when he does come and we'll have eternal peace forever. So um, just so much hope is embodied in this one little, uh, well, two verses of prophecy that um, is shared with us. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting and I found in the study that was pointed out is the word um, us is in here a lot. It was given to us. We are the recipients of this. We are, God is reaching out and giving us this. And so um, what a way just to show how much he loves us, you know, and, and so, so in the Old Testament where we know Jesus tells us that all the time, but here is something that's even before that. So that's, that was really good. And then the other thing that I found really interesting in this study was the, um, there's a selected message by Ellen G. White. Now, I do a lot of reading. So this was like a character play. I could see this in a play like, but anyway, it says Satan had accused God of requiring self-denial of angels when he knew nothing of what it meant himself and when he would not himself make any self-sacrifice for others. This was the accusation that Satan made against God in heaven. And after the evil one was expelled from heaven, he continually charged the Lord with exacting service, which he would not render himself. So Christ came to the world to meet these false accusations and to reveal the father. So then our lesson ends with, well, what does that quote tell us about the character of God? And for me, it's just, he was uh, righteous. You know, he was just um, and caring and, you know, he kind of got it. Maybe I do need to totally understand what they're going through to, in all fairness, so that I know, can honestly show and know that, uh, what's needed and, and how to help them not just have my plan in place. It's like getting, being the leader that is not, um, the leader or boss, let's say in your job, who is worth getting his hands dirty. It's okay. It's, it's okay to get him dirty to understand and know that you're, you know, you're part of the team, you know? So that's kind of what I saw with that. So in ending this, um, what does that quote tell you guys about the character of God? Yes, anybody. <laughs> what do you think, Charles? <laughs> Um, well, I think that, you know, it's just a beautiful thing that, uh, you know, the messianic uh, prophecies that just foreshadow Christ's coming and uh, that he just, you know, is, you know, coming back, but also that um, through everything, you know, God is uh, just always out for our good and like for the, for the, um, uh, the best for us too, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the things that struck me is that um, when you put a list of these kind of responsibilities, you predict that they're going to take place um, in the life of a particular person that you know is coming to this world to be a hero and a savior and a warrior against evil. And I mean, think of all the responsibility that this passage puts on somebody's shoulders. Uh, I think it's amazing. That's, it it's a, a, a huge load yeah, to it is, uh, and carry. It is. Yeah, and I got the fact that it was, he's going to do it. I don't know, you know, when we bring people aboard to a new position or someone new, you know, to help you out with something, you hope. You know, yeah, it looks like you have these attributes. We hope, you know, and sometimes that doesn't come out that way, but we know here it's will be and we know, you know, so 
Yes, we do know, and we we know that the character of Jesus matched the father, the character of the father, and so the father couldn't help but send somebody exactly like himself, you know, that had all these characteristics. And even though the Holy Spirit told the prophet what this character was going to be like, it still is a huge load to me. I mean, it's um, amazing. I carry the load of being a father of four children and and three stepchildren and that is a, a massive load all by itself and when you read this i mean he's gonna it look i mean it sounds like he's gonna carry the whole world doesn't it he's gonna carry the universe on his shoulders and what shoulders they are amazing all right, so Charles, we're ready for um, Tuesday's lesson, are we not? Yeah. Um, Tuesday's lesson, uh, the title is The Rod of God's Anger. And in Tuesday's lesson, it talks about, uh, it goes into the scripture and, and it goes into Isaiah verses 9, 1 through 5, but also uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, um, chapter 9 verses 8 through all the way to verse um, chapter 10 and chapter 10 and verse 2 and then it also mentions Leviticus 26 chapter 26 verses 14 and 39 so it's a very um, a, a lot of substance to wrap our heads around but uh, you know in, in this uh, when we read these uh, passages we see a picture of God and it looks like God could be harsh, very harsh, and very critical of, you know, his nation, of his people. However, when we consider free, free will of allowing people to do what they want to do, knowing that free will gives the ability to um, do what we please and what we find fit, we see that God is actually a loving God, because if there was control, if God was controlling us, then it would be more of him as a dictator or him installing fear and controlling us, which leads to abuse. And God, it doesn't say God is abuse or an abuser. It says God is love. And so with this being said, um, as we read the passages of Isaiah, we see that there are consequences, uh, many consequences. And they are the outcomes of mostly our decisions. And also we see that there are enemies of is the Israelites too and that we become vulnerable when we uh, are more focused on the world and not God himself, or we become vulnerable to Satan himself, to his attacks too. So we become vulnerable uh, to our enemies. So an example of this, uh, just to make it more clarified, is if we think of a child, and a child is told by his parents not to trust or associate with a group of kids, uh, who get in trouble, uh, we, we can see that um, if the child disobeys the parents, you know, um, words of advice, that we'll, let's see that what happens is that the bad kids, you know, he associates himself with the bad kids and the bad kids or the, you know, the, the group of uh, misfits take them to, you know, their house and then they decide to throw eggs at the neighbor's house. And then on that point, you know, he decides to throw eggs at the neighbor's house too. So the kid who was told not to go with, you know, the, the bad group uh, gets in trouble as well. And we can see that A, the association with the wrong group um, led to, or it was already a mistake. Uh, B, um, the kid decided to throw eggs. And uh, C, we see the consequences of his decisions. And so, however, um, we, so with this being said, we see that, you know, the kid had a, a free will, the choice to listen to, you know, his parents, his, his mother, his father, or to disobey them and choose his own path. And however, uh, regardless of this, God is a, uh, a parent who is graceful when, when we, the kid does get in trouble or when we, as I can say, the kid represents us or the Israelites, uh, 
you know, the parent says, I told you what the consequences were. I told you what was going to happen if, you know, if you did A and B, and I told you what was going to happen. But God doesn't punish us, but he tells us what not, not to do it again. And, but he tells us the consequences if we do it again. And uh, again, it's our free will. So this is a, similar to what we were reading in Isaiah. God told them, you know, if you guys keep on doing this, you know, this is the consequences. But he keeps on telling and keeps on telling and keeps on telling. If you keep on doing this, this is going to happen. If you keep on doing this, this is going to happen. And it keeps on going and going. So it shows that not only that God is giving us and the Israelites opportunity to repent and to come to him, but he's also showing that he's long suffering, that he's given them grace and that he's given them forgiveness. But um, in this world, we have become bold in our transgressions. We have become absolutely, um, you know, just sometimes always sinning and sinning and sinning. I mean, we look at the world around us and it's constantly just evil. And sometimes it's very hard to live in this world. And we say, you know, we, as we're kind of saying, you know, come back, Lord, you know. Um, but at the same time, when, you know, we are doing something uh, and our con the consequences keep on coming back and coming back. But the Lord is gracious to say, come back to me, come back to me, and I'll take you for who you guys are. And in Isaiah, it, it reminds us of that too, that even though the people departed from God, even though we depart from God, even though, you know, I depart from God, God still is faithful. He is still there. He says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And these promises and these, this, these words are not similar to sometimes a parent because uh, an earthly parent, because sometimes an earthly parent, you know, it's hard for when an action like that is done to be forgiving, to be, you know, merciful and just and kind. But our Heavenly Father says that, you know, again, we, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but also the consequences you have made or the Israelites have made, I will suffer for that. I'm going to suffer the consequences. I will suffer the penalty. I will suffer what's going to happen next. And so, as this um, for Tuesday's lesson is, as it says, it's talking about the rod of God's anger. And the rod of God's anger is that when we come, you know, when we have a consequence that God tells us not to do that again, because we're learning that we're learning that, you know, I didn't like what happened. I didn't like what I did and the consequences and the fear that was put in me and, you know, the, the feelings of, you know, unsure on being unsure, but with God, we know that we can be sure that, not only that we can come back to him, but he lets us know to not go back to the, those sinful ways or those wrong ways. And he lets us, um, he gives us an opportunity to come to him and learn from those mistakes. But with sin, there's always consequences. And sometimes we don't learn. So it just keeps on going and going and going. And sometimes we see God uh, doing those things, but actually it's because we, again, associated with the wrong people, we're doing the wrong things, and it all stems down to free will. However, God does allow these things to happen, just like the parent, um, so that we do learn our lesson in a sense where we see that not only was this wrong, but that, you know, when I'm in a really, really bad situation, um, the only person I can turn to is God, and that he's always going to be faithful and it's always going to be there for me. So God's, when we think of a rod, we can think of a shepherd and we can think of how a shepherd doesn't really uh, hurt his flock, but he leads them with the rod. He leads them to safety and he leads them out of uh, danger. So that is it for uh, Tuesday's lesson. And uh, we can just be assured that he's always there for us. Okay. Thank you, uh, Charles. I was kind of wondering what you thought about the verses um, that starts with a verse 20. The, um, it seems kind of interesting to me anyway, when I talked about how the uh, Syrians scattered everybody. Yeah. And then here in these verses, it talks about a remnant of Israel being uh, returning to God. Mm. 
but what it doesn't say is where they're coming from. <laughs> you notice that? Yeah. They don't yeah. say, well, they're coming from um, around Galilee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they're coming from, you know, wherever the Assyrians transplanted them. Right. They're coming from anywhere where they uh, where they are. God is going to call even the 10 tribes that went into captivity by the Assyrians um, to return to him. Yeah. And they get the call of the Messiah just like everybody else as far as I'm as far as I can tell. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was actually reading Ezekiel and Ezekiel was also saying that uh, when you when turmoil was going to happen you guys are going to be scattered the remnants going to be scattered but i will bring them back to me again so it's kind of good yes thing. all right so um we're ready to um move into um wednesday's lesson and i'm gonna make this one uh, even though we could have a lot of fun with this particular chapter chapter 11 of isaiah uh, we could have a lot of fun, and there's a few key verses here that I might just call to your attention, and then um, we'll let um, Pastor Gary wrap up and uh, do uh, the Thursday lesson. But in verse 1 of chapter 11, I find to be especially interesting, and a few after that. Um, the Bible says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. You know, it's kind of interesting what happens with um, when you cut trees down. <laughs> Have you ever cut a tree down and just left the stump? Now, sometimes if you just leave the stump there, it's just in the way, you know, you can't, you have to mow around it. You, uh, you have to um, walk around it. It's just uh, an obnoxious thing that is left there. If you leave a little too much stump though, oftentimes um, these small branches start growing off of that big stump that you left. And pretty soon it looks like a bush <laughs> rather than a tree. And so um, here, you, here you have a picture that the prophet Isaiah is giving of this stump that was left. And then out of this stump, there is some things that start to grow. And the, the way the messianic prophecy is given, that there's a shoot that comes out of the tribe of Judah that grows and will continue to grow until it takes in. It's kind of like the prophecy in Daniel with the image and when the stone comes along and knocks its feet down, and then it becomes, it grows into a massive kingdom that encompasses in the entire world. And so, you know, the picture is kind of a hero picture, it's something small coming in to take over and win the battle against evil. And some of those stories are really terrific to, um, to read and be a part of. I also like the um, verses um, in, ver in going over to verse six. How do you picture this? The wolf shall, shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. That's an amazing, the calf and the lion, the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. Where in the world would that ever take place if you can't picture moving on past the uh, problems of this world when there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth and God restores the mentality <laughs> and, um, of the wolf and the leopard so that they are not taken over and plagued by sin and their natural uh, instincts. This is a picture far, um, so far anyway, far into the future when God is going to set things right. He's going to restore 
the um, his people and all the uh, way that he created in the beginning. They shall not hurt in verse nine. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Now, when you get discouraged, I would encourage you to put on your refrigerator Isaiah 11. And you could even print out some of these verses. Because if you get discouraged or things go wrong and your house breaks down or falls down or, you know, the rain leaks through the roof, I mean, <clears throat> you can get your um, bring encouragement to yourself by reminding yourself that God is still in charge. He's still um, the creator of the world. And he will one day set things right. I love those verses. They mean so much to me. So um, <clears throat> I think our last chapter, um, Pastor Gary is going to pick this up in chapter 12, the first, uh, first few verses. So uh, Pastor Gary, can you uh, step up? Well, it's, it's extremely difficult to cover three chapters of Isaiah in 50 minutes or 45 minutes. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> I'm going to be very brief and just remind people if you didn't read chapter 12, you should. Because I think it, it, it says, it begins by saying, you will say in that day. What day is it? It's the day when Messiah comes the first time. It's also that day when Messiah comes the second time. And in oh. these three chapters in which there's, you know, warnings against God's righteous anger against sin and if he didn't have angry anger against sin what kind of god would he be because he sees the harm and the hurt that it does to people uh and and so it's it says in that day you will say it, as we're looking back especially if we talk about the second coming of the messiah in that day when you see how god has put into play his plan of salvation how he is made it real, how he has dealt with sin, in that day, you are going to be able to give thanks to the Lord. Because though he was angry with us, rightfully so, all have sinned and fallen short, his anger was turned away, and you comfort us. And that word comfort is interesting. It, it's the idea of breathing heavy as you come along somebody who's hurting and somebody that you're empathizing with, and you are you are experiencing their pain and you are able to comfort them because you have come alongside them. And it says, God is my salvation. He is my strength and my song. And these words of praise in this passage are not words of, I'm going to be quiet and reverent. These are words of shouting. These are words of singing aloud. These are words of proclaiming God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And it says in that day, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Interesting, the word wells. This is not talking about deep wells where the water is kind of there and collected and could be stagnant and warm. This is talking about waters that come out of a rock, waters that come out of a brook. These are fresh waters that continually come to refresh. And it says you will proclaim that his name is exalted. And finally, you will shout for joy because great in your midst, God's presence is with his people. Of all the things to be thankful for, I think that's the, the thing we can be thankful for the most, even while we're here on this earth, that God's presence is with us. And so with that in mind, let's just thank God for that presence, shall we? Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you are the God who does great deeds. We thank you that you provide water that springs up into eternal life. We thank you that you come close to us and next to us to comfort us. As we think about your plan of salvation, may we be grateful for how perfect it is and that we can trust you to be our strength and our song in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Have a good Thank week. Thank you for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.